Uh, welcome to the Advocate Pro Parade of Homes. I am your host, Sandra Baker. With me, I have Bernard. Uh, he is uh, going to share about his home in Harson Island, Michigan. Uh, we know all homes have financial and emotional value, and there seems to be a very special, special story about your home, Bernard. Uh, can you share with our audience how you developed uh, this home and what your emotional and financial uh, value is? Sure, I'd be happy to do that for you, Sandy. Um, I'll take you back to the way in the beginning when I bought a home on Lake St. Clair. I lived there for some 26 years, uh, right on the lake, and it was an incredible place uh, in St. Clair Shores, Michigan. And I found a piece of property that had a small 1950s ranch home built on it and it was for sale and when i walked into the place i stood in the uh, sunroom and looked uh, across the river at squirrel island and walpole island which are one of the uh, only unceded territories by native americans in in the country uh, one of very few i looked across at that i, I know walpole island because i used to fish up that way when i was younger and I looked upstream of the St. Clair River, uh, south channel of the St. Clair River and downstream and looked at the horizon and the fact that there was uh, a view that was unbeatable. And it's all natural land for the exception of a couple of houses uh, that belong to the Native Americans over there on Squirrel Island. And I looked at the property and I looked around at the house and I said to myself, this is not the house I want to live in, but this is where I want to be. The orientation was a southwest exposure. Um, the river just a few feet away from the back door. Uh, it had uh, a boathouse at the time with a lift in it. And I loved the fish. So I looked around scratched my head, went home, thought about it overnight, made an offer and bought the house. I knew it needed to be remodeled and I wanted to put a second story on it <clears throat> because the views from the second story are even more incredible than from the first. So um, after we negotiated a deal, um, I actually rented it out for a couple of years while I got my uh, business in order and uh, got my old house sold and then started a remodel process. It took about two to three years to really design uh, what I wanted. There were some restrictions from the township because uh, of, of a number of reasons, uh, but uh, I had to rebuild on the same footprint in the remodel. So it took a while to design to put all of the functionality, the design features, the character that I wanted to instill in the home into it. And uh, after three years, uh, we started tearing and tearing down the old and building the new. It took almost, well, just about three years from the time we started the teardown to the time we actually moved in. Uh, we moved in and I think it was December 2003, we started in the spring and we moved in and it was 95% completed and we got certificate of occupancy and, and then continued to finish, put up the finishing touches on the house. Um, there are, it, it's, it's all custom built. It was well thought out in terms of uh, where all the mechanical equipment was going to be located for noise suppression, where all the piping was going to be run so that there was never a problem with uh, freezing pipes up in the Michigan winters and all that sort of thing that uh, it takes a lot of attention. But beyond the mechanical part of it, um, I had some real great craftsmen who helped me build the house. I general contracted it, did the design work, general contracted it, 
and hired all of my own people to do everything from cement work to the mechanical work to the electrical work uh, to the finished woodwork and painting, et cetera. And uh, I took my time because I wanted it right. I actually, uh, over one winter when the house was built, but wasn't finished on the inside, I took the time over a winter to make sure that I'd get out there and check and see if there are any leaks in terms of when the wind was blowing and caulked and patched and fixed and did all the little detail things that don't get paid attention to. Uh, and when it came to finish work, uh, we tried to select, I tried to select um, all top quality, top end uh, materials. Uh, it has uh, number one grade hardwood floors. It's all hard maple. Um, the um, cabinetry in the kitchen is all custom installed. Um, it's all high-end appliances in the kitchen and so forth in the bathrooms all of the door handles and plumbing fixtures are all top end uh, talk talk about attention to detail i had a i had a friend who helped me do a lot of the finish work on the house and uh he did some incredible things uh he uh there's, as, as you'll notice in the in the video, when you see the video, when you see the pictures of the house, you'll see an expansive loft with a curved uh, uh, upper level and curved glass that fits in. And he he did simple things like when he built the wood floor for that curve, he had to actually lay up and do it by hand and cut thin strips of. Uh, hard maple and glued and tacked them together into this big arch. And he brought over some uh, Brazilian cherry wood to put an accent stripe in it. So little things like that that don't get noticed. And when the banister got built, uh, we actually took a mahogany slug of wood and shaped this entire banister, had it custom cut on a, on a big CNC machine. Um, it, has, uh, it has an inlay of hard maple stripe that matches the hard maple or the uh, stripe on the, on the floor curve. It's all the little attention to detail. Uh, sure. Through the build process, uh, there are there is a, a library of photographs that show where everything is under under the drywall. Oh, so wow. you can know if you want to do anything in the house or expand it or modify anything that you can know where all of the plumbing is. You can know where every wire comes down the wall to an outlet where every outlet is and so forth, electrical outlet. So it's, it's, it's those kind of things and that kind of attention to detail that was put into the house. Uh, That's fantastic. A, uh, did you have anything to add to that or would you like to move on to what your fondest memories are of that home? Well, it, number one, it's a beautiful place to live. Uh, every every moment, uh, the, the house is designed so that as you look out the windows, the outside comes inside. Mm -hmm. You're literally living outdoors because it has lots of windows in it. There are no curtains or shade coverings except in the lower level bathroom and the bedroom, the guest suite, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, for some privacy from the road. But uh, other than that, uh, it's wide open and you literally living outdoors and you don't see very many houses that are in close proximity to you. You see green or you see water and you see the river traffic coming up and down. All of the um, shipping traffic com that comes through the Great Lakes comes past the house day and night, 365 days a year. 
So mm-hmm. you'll see ships from all over the world uh, continually passing your door. Right. Uh, you'll see naval ships being built up someplace in Wisconsin, the USS Detroit, for instance, uh, mm-hmm. which is a new build by the US government, came by uh, a couple of months ago, or actually it was about a year ago. Uh, each year there's a tall ships festival and the tall ships come up the river. So there's always an interesting palette of, of color and interesting things going on on your day-to-day living there. It's like That's living cool. in a museum and having somebody pass all of the artifacts of the museum past your door every day. Great. That's great. So the other unique value is the rich history of the home and the island. Can you share with our audience a little about that? Well, the home was built in the 1950s. Um, In terms of the island, uh, the island, Harsons Island was really um, Las Vegas before Las Vegas existed. If you can imagine the uh, the island was was purchased from the Indians by Jacob Harson back in the 1800s, early 1800s. And in the late mid to late 1800s, uh, uh, people like Henry Ford and Freddie Firestone and Alva Edison were all friends. And there was a place that was established called the Old Club, the Old fishing and hunting club and they used to come out to the island uh, and fish and hunt there There it was a lodge and a a place to be a a club if you will for the rich folks it still remains a club for the rich folks on the island it's called the old club Uh, you still have to have substantial funds in order to join and um, it's an interesting place. In the early 1900s, as I said, it became Las Vegas before Las Vegas existed. Uh, there was no air conditioning back in those days. So uh, when, when ship traffic moved from being sailboats to steamboats, Uh, And in the early 1900s, there was the great migration from Europe. Many people came to this country and they came across to the Detroit area. And in order to travel further west, they would take steamships and so forth or sailing boats around the Great Lakes to get further west. Uh, When steamships came in, one of the steamship lines called... uh, Oh, I think it was called the White. I can't recall the name of the company, uh, but they built a steamship called the Tajmu Steamer. It carried almost three thousand passengers. Mm. It was a big double paddle wheel steamboat, and they had a schedule, and they'd leave Detroit each morning at around eight thirty, and they'd come across Lake Saint Clair, and they'd stop at the old club. And then they'd stop at a number of hotels and clubs and private docks and the San Susi Landing, which was a place where they stopped and dropped off uh, goods for islanders that needed to be, you know, that were purchased and ordered and so forth. They'd travel up to Port Huron, which is uh, the top end of the St. Clair River, where Lake, Lake Huron drops into the St. Clair River. And then they'd turn around and they'd return and make the same stops on the return trip to Detroit. So for a day trip, if you can imagine in 1910 or 1915, um, you could take your family and get on the Tashmo steamer, come to Harsons Island, jump off there, spend a day at the Tashmo Park on Harsons Island that the steamship lines established in order to improve their traffic flow and number of people that came. And uh, you could picnic there and they had sports and games and fishing and, and swimming and all sorts of activities for folks. And uh, 
you could catch the five o'clock fair uh, Tajmu steamer back to uh, to Detroit and make a day of it, wow. or you could stay, or you could stay at a lodge or a hotel for a few days or a week. Mm -hmm. So there's a tremendous amount of history. I was actually involved with the establishment of the historical society, Parsons Island St. Clair Flats Historical Society on the island back in 2010, 9, 10, 11, 12. I think I was with them for about six years, helped them get uh, a museum established and so forth. Uh, it's a very interesting place. The folks there today are wonderful people. There's a very tight island knit, or tight knit island group of people. Uh, and they're very welcoming. It's, uh, it's a fun place to live. There's uh, an association that uh, if it's a voluntary association if you wish to participate to um, for the betterment of the island. They handle anything that has issues with governmental issues or anything like that. Um, and then there's the Historical Society. Uh, there are a number of activities on the island. There's lots of uh, commercial, not commercial, there's lots of charter fisher, fishermen uh, who work uh, off the island. Right. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of hunting. It's one of the, it's right in the migratory pathway of the spring and fall migration. Yeah, migration of the uh, of waterfowl. And uh, the, Michigan Department of Natural Resources manages a huge area there. It's all marshland. And it's some of the best duck hunting uh, area in the world. People come from far and wide to, to come hunt there. Uh, in terms of fishing, uh, if folks don't know, Lake St. Clair and the surrounding waters and the delta that the uh, Parsons Island is in that area is some of the best fishing in the world. People come again from all over the country and sometimes around the world to fish Lake St. Clair. Mm. Uh, there's, uh, there's lots of sports fishing going on there all the time. Well, it sounds like a fascinating, wonderful home. And uh, the island is just fascinating to me. You know, I, I, I uh, was reading a lot about it and it's it's a, a beautiful home so in closing would you like to share anything as we close out the discussion well um it's a home that i've that i've built and put my heart and soul into and uh, i'm part of me doesn't want to sell it but life circumstances have changed uh, to the point where I think it is best that, uh, that I move on. Uh, so it has a tremendous emotional connection. Um, I love the place. I absolutely love the place. There's no question about that. Um, but uh, everything in life changes. And when you get to a certain age, it's time to do something different. And I think we're at that point, at that juncture, um, I'm hoping that I can find a person or a family that will appreciate the house mm -hmm. as much as I do and appreciate the work and the quality that's gone into it. Of course. Yeah. All righty then. Um then we can uh, say goodbye and thank you so much uh, for sharing about your home with us. You're welcome, Sandy. It's been, right. it's been good talking to you. Thank you. You too. Thanks. Bye-bye.